Come on, grab your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, I want to begin reading with verse 23. Everybody in creation knows the love and admiration and respect and how close, near, and dear to my heart is the entire West family. And I acknowledge Pastor Ralph West, my little brother, and to First Lady West. We appreciate her and this entire first family. Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 23. Forgive me for the lengthy reading. I promise I'll make up the time in the sermon. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the accounting, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, but because he could not repay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything that he possessed and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees and begged him, saying, have patience with me, I will repay you everything. His master's heart was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him, canceling the debt. But the same slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and he seized him and began choking him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow slave fell on his knees, begged him earnestly, have patience with me, I will repay you, but he was unwilling. He went, had him thrown in prison until he paid back the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. They went and reported to their master with clarity and in detail everything that had taken place. Then his master called him and said to him, you wicked and contemptible slave, I forgave all that great debt of yours because you begged me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave who owed you little by comparison as I had had mercy on you? And in wrath, his master turned him over to the torturers, the jailers, until he paid all that he owed. My heavenly father will also do the same to every one of you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. I, I want to talk, and I want you to wrestle with me about the twisted side of forgiveness. You may be seated, even in the presence of the Lord. To elaborate on the length, breadth, height, and depth of Jesus' expectation when it comes to forgiveness, the difficult absorption of its practice, Jesus likens it to a story he decides to share. He understands that forgiveness is such a hard field to plow. Hurt is such a fast maturing seed when deeply planted. Life is such a strange mixture of human attachment and human pain that forgiveness is a hard field to plow. Forgiveness is such a hard spiritual discipline to practice. It's such a difficult root to tap. It's such an extremely high virtue to grasp that Jesus presses it into a parable because the straight dosage of its truth is too hard to swallow. A king has decided he wanted to audit his affairs. He's entitled to do it because he owns it all. His desire is to know what his servants have been doing with what has been entrusted to them. While doing that, a servant is brought before him who owes him a significant amount. In today's terms, it's believed to be about $10,000. Don't know if the debt he has incurred is so much because a lot was originally entrusted to him, or has his inability to pay been because he hasn't been paying back for some elongated time. At any rate, when presented to the king on that day, his debt stands at about $10,000. If he cannot satisfy this debt on this day while standing before the king, he, his wife, his family are going to be taken in exchange and they're going to have to serve enslaved the interests of the king until the entirety of the debt is dissolved. Again, there is no explanation as to how it became so much, no peek into the arrangements between he and the servant, no mention of when the original due date was and how it passed, no details other than the debt itself. But the pain 
of potentially losing his family pushed this servant to fall on his knees to beg the king for an extension and he makes the solemn promise that he'll repay what he owes if simply given more time. And remarkably, the king is so moved and stirred, he releases him of the threat of family enslavement. And then on top of that, he releases him of the entirety of the debt. Now, of course, it's obvious to see, is it not, the extreme extension of compassion, empathy, grace. You didn't give me what you owed me. You couldn't repay me when I wanted it. I'm moved by your serious intent to try. I let you remain free to enjoy life, and I eliminate your debt. Now, I don't know how you all define that. To me, that's grace. And maybe that's why we have no details regarding the specifics of the debt, nor the arrangements for repayment of the same, because the power is not in the size of the debt. The power is in the size of the forgiveness. And that's what makes the next move for the servant so shocking to me. It's why I'm offended when I read the text. It's why, to me, the servant is spiritually twisted. The same servant, just forgiven his debt, walks away from the king with the gift of grace, the gift of compassion, the restoration of a life that should have been destroyed. And he finds one of his fellow servants, meaning he sought him out, He's owed by this servant, but a fraction of the amount he himself owed the king. In fact, in today's economic environment, it's $20. Listen to verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. His fellow servant fell to his knees, begged him, be patient, I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, went off, had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw how recklessly he was stewarding abundant forgiveness, how opposite he acted towards another for less money than the money he himself owed the king, a king, might we remind ourselves, who gave him nothing but grace and compassion. They, in their outrage, go and reveal to the king the way the servant mishandled the gift and the stewardship of forgiveness. You evil servant. I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you have been compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant? The king is furious, put the screws to the man, one translation says, until he paid back his entire debt. Now the lesson, Church Without Walls, that Jesus is pressing is the need, of course, to receive the enormous gift of forgiveness that frees your life, cancels your debt, restores your chance to live your life to the fullest. However, the lesson is also the expectation of the forgiven to then honor it by indiscriminately giving forgiveness to those who are around you just immediately gift to others what has been generously gifted to you. Because not one grace that God has extended to our lives does he want us to withhold from extending to somebody else's life. No excuse for not being nice because God has been so nice to you. And there's something about that in terms of human expectation, isn't it? That makes us expect this of each other. Which is why the other servants who probably had debts of their own were so furious and angry because they saw, they heard, they witnessed, they observed the power of forgiveness to save a servant and his family and how that forgiveness twisted, mismanaged until instead of using forgiveness to give him the opportunity to be generous to another, that forgiveness gives him license to choose the opposite. And I want to tease it out for a minute because I suspect that some of us in the room today have severely misinterpreted, misapplied, misappropriated the power of God's forgiveness in our lives until we are meaner Christians than we were before we met Jesus. 
I want to tease it out because some of us are more judgmental saved than we were people living lost. Allow me to tease it out because some of us are more darkly opinionated living with anointing than we were living spiritually bankrupt. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how cruel Christians can be when living with so much of the Lord's compassion. How unkind we can become to each other when we are living with nothing but the abundant kindness of God. I don't get it. It's the irony we see in the text. Apparently, the servant has come across the other servant that owed him but $20. He's come across him before. He didn't take their exchange to this level of cruelty or abstention from forgiving him. They both served the interests of the king. And if the servant was trying to repay a $10,000 debt, you and I know he could have gotten $20 off of this other brother at any time. But he doesn't agitate his life to get his small $20 until after he is liberated of a huge debt. He then turns around and acts awful to another man over a far lesser debt. Maybe it was the way he twisted being forgiven. It made him pull on his wickedness rather than lean on his having been forgiving. And that's what I want to tease out because I think it was the very forgiveness extended itself. That the man twisted until it made him regret having needed to be forgiven in the first place. He then turns around and expresses instead of gratitude, he expresses cruelty and treats another servant in a cruel fashion maybe it was the way the servant twisted being forgiven that made him pull on his wickedness rather than lean on his having been forgiven it is the meat of the parable that Jesus shares it reminds me of another parable that Jesus also offers when a corrupting spirit is expelled from somebody it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis Some unsuspecting soul, it can be devil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'm going to go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person swept and dusted but vacant. It then runs out, rounds up seven other spirits dirtier than itself. They all move in, hooping it up, and the person ends up far worse as if he had never been cleaned up in the first place. The only point I want to make, and it won't take me long, is this. Don't twist forgiveness until it makes you toxic rather than helpful. Don't resent the debt you are owed that needed forgiveness you received until it makes you unable to extend the grace you've been given to somebody else because I suspect the emotional trauma of this servant's encounter with the king made him leave the king's presence ignoring the grace and resenting the debt as having to beg for he and his family's future. And now he's determined, I will never be placed in that position again. He takes his urgency, his immediate want to shift focus onto somebody else. And he started resenting what placed him in this position in the first place. Is anybody listening to me? It made him forget all that grace that was just poured out on him by a sympathetic and empathetic king. It's strange to me that the servant receives mercy and grace. And the first thing he does in response is find somebody to be mean to. How you do that? Unless you resent the fact that you needed to be forgiven in the first place. And I wonder, I wonder if much of our human struggle is really not knowing how to properly absorb God's grace. Stay with me. I wonder... If many of us twist our spiritual condition 
because we cannot appropriate how to live knowing we could not have straightened our lives out by ourselves. Oh, we're great at receiving grace. We're great at celebrating grace. We're just not too good at incarnating it. As much as it can set you free, it can also bind you up. Spirituality is to resent your need to have been forgiven and rescued. And you can resent that God knows your outer expressions are sometimes opposite your inner secrets. That God knows that those who see you on Sunday only see the outer expression that smells of anointing. But God knows and you know he knows that you carry a duplicity in personality that bleeds a duplicity in action until the same person who comes to church is diametrically opposite after the benediction. It's the struggle for all of us. When we practice what I want to call intellectual idolatry, what I might even want to call today forgive, forgiver's remorse. You know, like survivor's remorse, where you start to feel guilty that everybody else died in the accident but you. Well, here in the text, it's the struggle of understanding why a king would ever be so kind to me and I feel so guilty about it. I don't like the fact that I had to grovel and get on my knees and beg him for an extension and I get up having been given grace, but I resent it. So what do I do? I take my anger out on somebody else rather than to get up and thank God that I've been given grace to have another chance. Can I tell somebody in here, don't apologize for how dirty your yesterday was. Celebrate how open with opportunity your tomorrow is and don't let yesterday corrupt you until you can't shake hands with grace today. I'm, I'm trying to hurry. So, so what if I told you, what if I told you that what is keeping you from stepping into a powerful place in life is that you can't reconcile that it was given to you by grace and not your human perfection. Come here for a minute. What if I told you that you thought it was because you cute? Oh, you thought you where you are because you're smart and because you're well-connected. But what if I told you that at some point you're going to have to accept with your cute, smart, connected self that neither of the three can adequately explain why you're still here. That the only explanation for why you are where you are is grace. And do I have any company in here is anybody other than me come to the place where grace is good enough an explanation? I ain't got to tell you where I graduated from. I can't tell you why I'm in this pulpit today. I can't explain to you why God has decided to bless me. And it has little to do with where I grew up, who bore me into this world, or the intellect I bring to this enterprise. I don't mind telling you I'm here because of grace. Do I have any company here? And don't you let grace being your passport make you resent your trip. So this is what happens when you sit in first class on a hookup and then you're scared to order anything because you know you didn't pay for your ticket. And I borrow the phrase from the charismatics, the devil is a liar. If grace sits me in first class, I'm eating it all. I'm enjoying it all. I'm watching every movie. I'm talking to everybody. And I ain't got to explain it to you. You can ask me how I got up here. And I'm going to respond, ain't none of your business. I'm up here. And that's all that counts. You paid for yours. Jesus paid for mine. Ooh, Lord. 
Come on, tell somebody, this is grace. It's my only explanation. I walk with it every day. I drive in it every day. I get to look at it when it wakes up and goes to sleep every day. It's grace. All right, I don't have time. Let me, let me push this one more layer. See how twisted thinking can get even when it's about progress? And here's the big takeaway. When God has been this gracious to you like the king is to this servant in the text, let it change you. Don't just receive it. Don't just rejoice over it. Let it change you. Above the debt being forgiven and the mercy being extended and the slavery being eliminated and the freedom being extended, life starting all over again, what this servant needed more than all of the aforementioned is to let what the king offered him change him until he treated others differently. He sadly proves, listen, that you can be walking around with a gift not changed. Let what God is doing in your life do more than benefit you. Let what God is doing in your life do more than rescue you. Let what God is doing in your life do more than bless you. Let it change you. Don't become religious and be faithful to your practice of faith until you don't allow yourself to be transformed by your faith. Let what God is doing do more than advance and progress and elevate you. Let it change you, not just reposition you, not just cancel your debt, not just elevate your status, not just get you out of trouble, but let God's grace change you. That's what Isaac Newton says, and I conclude he's right. Everything continues in a state of rest until it is compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. That force for us has been the powerful forgiveness of God. Don't let the force of God work all around your life and not agitate the rest state of your mind and behavior and thinking. Let it compel change inside of you for God's sake. Don't pile up in the church without walls week after week shouting at the altar and going out the door unchanged. No, every time you come, thank God for every blessing, but leave out with a transformation and let me be better this week than I was last week I'm done I'm done these words Ralph were scribbled on the tomb of an Anglican bishop in the crypts of Westminster Abbey it read the following I take my seat when I was young and free and my imagination had no limits I dreamed of changing the world as I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change, so I shortened my sight somewhat and decided to change only my country. It, too, seemed immovable as I grew into my twilight years, and one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it, and now as I lie on my deathbed, I suddenly realize if I had only changed myself... Then by example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration, I would have then been able to better my country. And who knows, I may have been able to change the world. Why are you in here praying that God changed somebody else? Why don't you start by asking God to change you? I'm not speaking to them because they didn't speak to me. I'm not being nice to them because they were not nice to me. I ain't opening a door for nobody because nobody opened the door for me. No, why don't don't you stop by saying, I had nobody open a door for me, but I'm opening a door for somebody else so that they can learn how to open a door. Do I have any company here? Because lest we be naive, that's exactly what God did for us. If you follow me up to a skull-shaped hill, this is what God did for us in the sacrifice of his son. He wants you to sacrifice for your neighbor, and he gave us an example by giving us his his son and the old preacher said he died on Friday 
but early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hand. Do I have any company in this room? I'm going to leave you alone because we didn't run out of time. But if you don't mind, would you put a smile on your face and turn to somebody next to you and tell them don't twist forgiveness because grace is too expensive. Don't corrupt forgiveness because grace is too expensive. Don't dilute forgiveness because grace is too expensive. And if you don't mind testifying, can somebody toss a head back? And if you don't mind, can you bring an expression up and help me close and holler amazing grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Tell somebody I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see through many dangers, tolls and snares. I have already come. Toss your head back and holler, twas grace. That's a good enough passport. Was grace. That's a good enough key. Tell somebody it was grace. That's why I work where I work. Grace. That's where I live where I live. Grace is why I know who I know. Grace is why I go where I go. Ain't got no other excuse me. I don't have any other explanation but the grace of God. Say yeah. Is passport enough? Don't resent having needed God forgiveness until it corrupts you and you start mistreating other people. That God can snatch you from a life of condemnation and you can't be patient with somebody else to get themselves together. The devil is a what? Hands are lifted. Heads are elevated. Eyes are closed. My brother, my sister, listen to me today. You want forgiveness. And I know you think you're strong. You've been able to fight your way through, over, out of a lot. But you can't get out of this one without grace. With that grace comes forgiveness. And God wants to gift that to your life so it can be the passport for the rest of your life. You won't have to explain. Your effort will not be as strong as the amazing grace he extends to your life. And you're one prayer away from it. Come on, pray with me out loud all over the sanctuary. God, I come. I can't hear everybody. God, I come. In Jesus' name. And I want to be saved. I need to be saved. Forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Come into my life. Save me. And I thank you that by faith in your son, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put those hands together all over the building. My brother, my sister.